Okay. I'm sorry, what? Okay, awesome. Uh, small group, that's good. I like small groups. Big groups are fun. I'm not scared. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to be walking around. Um, I, I hate standing behind a podium, and I love the wireless mic, so thank you for the wireless mic. Um, one time I'm in Vegas, they, uh, they didn't have a wireless mic, and they had a, um, this cable that I was connected, and I felt like a dog on a chain. It was, I hated it. Um, I've already spoken to many of you and introduced myself. My name is Jeffrey Kennedy. Uh, I'm the Chief Commodity Analyst at Elliott Wave International and also the editor of Traders Classroom. Um, Traders Classroom is really the product I love the most because it's educational. It gives me an opportunity to teach you uh, different styles of technical analysis, just not the wave principle, but also candlestick analysis, how to utilize your indicators and oscillators, uh, chart patterns like head and shoulders, inverted head and shoulders, those sorts of things all toward the idea of trying to get you up to speed so that you can identify what I consider to be high confidence trading opportunities on your own. So ideally, my ideal customer joins my service, say Traders Classroom, and they'll be a subscriber for two or three years and then on occasion I'll get an email and say, hey Jeff, I'm canceling my service. I'm sorry to do that, but I'm ready to go off on my own. I can do this for myself, and that's what I really love because it lets me know I'm doing my job as an educator uh, because I'm a very active trader. I've been where you're at. <clears throat> when I first started 25 years ago, uh, I did not have a mentor. I did not have somebody to help me out. So I did what many of you do, uh, buy the services, buy the subscriptions, buy the books, uh, go to the seminars, and honestly, uh, it didn't help my trading and that's when I started trying to think of things on my own and one of the key things and I always love recommending this gentleman's work uh, a gentleman by the I believe he's passed away unfortunately his name is Mark Douglas he wrote an awesome book excellent book called The Disciplined Trader and I highly recommend everybody to read it uh, and the reason why is because it talks about the real game of trading, and that's you. It's your psychology. It's your emotions. Um, the weakest link in a successful trading equation is always going to be the individual. So it's you. If something gets screwed up, guess what? It's your fault. That's just the way it is. And once you begin to understand that, you can begin to really work on the key component that will ultimately determine your success as a trader and that's you. If you want to improve your trading, improve yourself. It's quite simple. Now today's presentation is going to be very basic, but I like basic, I like simple. And one thing that's important to understand with what we do as technicians is the limits of my language are the limits of my universe. I love that quote. And the reason why is because it speaks directly to technical analysis. Who can read this? Oh, you can. <laughs> Very rarely do I have somebody who can actually read this. How about this? Anybody an electrical engineer? Oh, Doc is, of course. <laughs> How about this? I'm sure we have some musical types. Okay. Technical analysis is a language. The better you understand the language of technical analysis, the better you'll be able to understand the narrative of the market. So. Uh, the wave principle, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Here are some reasons why uh, I'm an Elliottician. I've been with EWI, Elliott Wave International, now for uh, 25 plus years, and this is what I enjoy. It helps me identify the trend, it identifies counter trend moves within the larger trend, it helps me identify the, uh, the maturity of a trend, it also uh, allows me to identify what I consider to be high probability objectives through the use of Fibonacci ratios retracements and multiples. And then it also allows me to identify when I'm wrong, uh, by, and that it does so by the means of the rules and the guidelines. Um, so, and this is the book I wrote with my co-author, Wayne Gorman. If you're interested, it's on Amazon. That's a shameless plug. Um, so, Basic Elliott. Uh, I spoke with one of you earlier, um, just a quick, uh, um, Jeff, I believe, uh, and, the, and I encounter this quite a bit whenever I'm speaking to crowds regarding the subject or the subject matter of the wave principle. 
and many people find it very confusing. I believe the reason it's confusing is because it's not taught well or taught properly. So we're going to be looking at the basics. The basics, mastering the basics will take you a very, very long way. Okay, now there, when it comes to the wave principle, there are literally about a hundred different rules and guidelines. And there's all kinds of, you know, uh, there are basic patterns, the core patterns, and then we have what I call variations and complexities. How many of you are familiar with, say, the Elliott Wave flat correction? You are? Or, well, my students are. Okay. Uh, well, you know there's a variation to that actual pattern. Uh, and that pattern would be, one variation would be the expanded flat. One variation would be the running flat. A uh, good example of a running flat in action was uh, a stock I was following and trading called IONS. Did a nice running flat prior to the big pop to the upside, if you're curious. Uh, but these are the five core patterns. Everything that we know about the Elliott Wave principle starts here. So, it, inundate yourself with these five patterns. If you can master these five patterns, you'll probably have a, a better skill set than some people who practice Elliott, you know, the weight principle that I see on the internet. Because I'm always, you know, looking at, you know, what somebody's thinking in another market, and I'm looking at their wave count. It's just like, okay, rule violation, didn't it follow the guideline, rule violation, no guideline, no guideline. And it's just, it's, if you're going to do Elliott, and let me just caution you right now, if you're going to include the wave principle in your, say, quote unquote, trader's toolbox, learn how to do it well. Follow the rules, follow the guidelines. Because if you do not, like any tool, it will hurt you. A knife in the hands of a skilled surgeon can save lives. A knife in the hands of a lunatic can take them. The wave principle is just a tool. Candlestick analysis is merely a tool. There's nothing magic to this stuff. But these are tools. As such, you, it, it's your responsibility to learn how to utilize these tools correctly or properly. Because if you start trying to do the wave principle and you're not following the rules and guidelines, you're going to be long a market right before it crashes, or vice versa. OK? Question? No question. Good. Um, <clears throat> so here are the five core patterns. What the wave principle does is it classifies price action essentially into two modalities. Uh, of the five core patterns, you have the two modalities. One is called motive wave, one's called corrective waves. The impulse and the diagonal fall into that uh, motive wave category. Your flat, triangle, and zigzag fall into your corrective wave ca uh, category. That's it, okay? Very simple. These are the five core patterns. It all starts here. Now, when I first began learning the wave principle, um, I had a real big disconnect. You can, I could see these line diagrams uh, on, a, uh, you know, on a plain white sheet of paper. Uh, I had a friend at the company who would you know, test me constantly, and he would draw these line diagrams, and I could, excuse me, but I could count the hell out of these things. It was easy to identify. But when I started to look at open, high, low, close price charts, my eyes crossed. I was just like, I, I couldn't see what was going on. So it's very important to me whenever I'm showing these line idealized diagrams to also show examples. This is what an impulse wave looks like, okay? Clean, clear, five subdivisions. You can clearly see this. Waves one, two, three, four, and five. Prices travel very far in a very short period of time. This is a great example of what a classic impulse wave looks like. Ending diagonal. We talked about this in uh, Trader's Classroom. Uh, I, I basically, again, whenever I'm doing Traders Classroom, it's a service that teaches people about really all forms of technical analysis. But I was using this as an example of an ending diagonal in Intel. Uh, ending diagonals are a terminating wave pattern that could only occur in the fifth wave position of an impulse wave or as wave C of either a zigzag or a flat. But this is what one looks like. Basically a rising wedge or sometimes referred to as a falling wedge, if you're familiar with um, Edwards and McGee and Bassetti. Zigzag, 535 pattern, ABC, something that you may want to write down because it's very important. I use it, I'm constantly living by it. Counter trend price action. Counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. So if you're looking at, a, in my style of trading, I, I, I don't try and pick tops or bottoms, I kind of gotten away from that. That just, 
you can do it. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it as well. But it's a tough game to do consistently, month in, month out, year in, year out. I'm very much of a trend trader. I like to find a market that has a well-established trend, and then all I do is I wait for those pullbacks. I wait for those counter-trend moves. It's easy. It's fun. Okay? Well, counter-trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. This is a flat. This was Goose Canada. Uh, I was tracking this uh, uh, back in late eight, uh, 2018. Uh, flat correction. You can clearly see the subdivisions. A, B, C down, three waves. A, B, C up, three waves. Impulsive decline in wave C. Easy. Okay, this is worth writing down as well. And this is what I teach my students, and this is what I do myself. A lot of times I'll get emails from my subscribers <clears throat> who, who, and it's something like this. Um, hey, I'm in XYZ stock. Um, the, the, I, I can't recognize the pattern. This is what I think it is. What do you think? Should I continue to hold it? Okay, my first idea is if you don't know what the hell's going on, why are you still in the stock? If, bottom line, if you can't count it confidently, don't trade it. All too often, and I, and I, I, mentioned, I had a brief conversation with Doc here, uh, day trading, for example, uh, a lot of times you'll begin to, who, who, who's ever day traded before? Who's ever like sat in front of a computer and looked at a price chart for like, not just four or five hours, but like 12, you know, you're watching overnight price action, okay. Your eyes are going to cross. You're going to start to see exactly what you want to see. Okay? Look at a chart. If you recognize a pattern, great. Run with it. Do some more analysis. Look a little bit deeper. But if you don't recognize it, walk away. If you can't count it, don't trade it. And all too often, I'll see you know, bad trades, and it all stems from a very unclear, a very confusing wave count. Triangle. Uh, specifically, this is referred to as a running triangle because your wave B terminates beyond your wave A um, origin. Triangles are important to understand because they always precede the final move of a sequence. In other words, they're, they're letting you know that the party's almost over. Um, and, and just very, very important. So, pop quiz. Who's had the coffee? Let's see who's been listening. Any idea what pattern this is? Remember, there's five patterns. Impulse, mode, uh, impulse, diagonal, zigzag, flat, and triangle. What does this look like? What? Okay. Does anybody say it's a correction? Good. You have had your coffee. I have to catch up on mine. Um, this is just a classic impulse wave. You've got a flat in the wave two position and a zigzag in your uh, fourth wave position. Two does not terminate below the origin of wave one. That's a rule. Wave three can never be the shortest impulse wave of waves one, three, and five, and wave four cannot end in the price territory of wave one. Classic. How about this? So this okay, now a lot of times, too, to arrive at a, the, the relevant or the operative wave count in a market, one way to go about it, there's two ways. Number one, you can look at a chart and see something clear, like the impulse wave we just looked at. Another way to arrive at the operative labeling in a particular market is to figure out what it is not. Okay? So, does this look like a motive wave or a corrective wave? Corrective. corrective? Anybody say motive? You guys are on top of it. No. This is clearly a corrective wave. If it's slow. It's choppy. There's a lot of swings that, or breakouts that seem to fail. It's a classic zigzag. It's a 535 pattern where your wave B here is a flat correction. Okay, now let's look at some real-time application because I'm a somewhat active trader. From that small arrow on your left to the larger arrow on your right, uh, is that price action, would you consider that to be motive wave price action or corrective wave price action? Because again, that one question Critically important because it's telling you uh, if you're starting, off, starting your wave count off on the right foot versus, say, digging yourself a hole. Is this motive or corrective? Corrective. corrective? Anybody say it's motive? Anybody want to try and count that as a developing series of ones and twos to the upside? 
slow, choppy price action contained within parallel lines tends to be a counter trend price move. For me, that screams a selling opportunity. Does everybody understand that concept? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, I need audience participation, otherwise I'm gonna start calling on you individually. It just helps me to do, speak better. Okay, <clears throat> this is the wave count. This is what we refer to as a complex correction. Don't let the name fool you. All that really means is that there's two types of corrective wave, two corrective wave patterns joined together by an X wave. <clears throat> and this was the trade I took as a result of that counter trend price action. This is what we were looking at right here. A, B, C, X, A, B, C. And it set the tone. Okay, the one takeaway from this slide I want you to remember, and again, worth writing down. I like to see something called confirming price action. Okay, I want to see something on the chart that begins to support my assessment. Okay, whenever I come to New York, I've learned one thing. I just don't walk across the street without looking. Why do you look? Why do you look left and right? And actually left, right, left, right, two or three times. Why do you not do that? <laughs> exactly. Okay, well you wanna make sure nothing's coming. Okay, what you're doing by pausing at, at the street and looking left and right and left and right is you're waiting for confirming price action. You're looking for, hey, making sure the way is clear. Point being, this was an extremely profitable trade for me. But notice, I didn't pick the top here. I don't care about picking the top. I'm looking to uh, identify a place I can jump in where I think I have the best odds of having a, or experiencing a successful outcome. In other words, stop trying to pick the top and pick the bottom of a market, okay? It can be futile at times. It's, you can do it, I've done it. I, again, I, I have no doubt every one of you have done it at least once, and it's great. You got bragging rights around the water cooler. You, you feel like, oh man, I'm so brilliant. Watch out Wall Street, here I come. I'm gonna be on the cover of Barron's. <clears throat> it's a hard game to do consistently, year in and year out, okay? Let's take a look at this price action. Who can count this? What do I have? Now remember, five core patterns. Impulse wave, that's a five wave move where the waves do not overlap. The ending diagonal, that looks like a rising or falling wedge. Then you have your zigzag, your flat, and your triangle. Okay? Maybe this might help. Best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So if you see a price chart such as this, Try and section it off and focus on what you do recognize. How many waves do we have here? Five waves down. The importance of a five wave move is that it identifies, allows you to identify the trend of the higher degree. What do we have here? Well, answer is five, everybody got it correct. What about this move? Three wave move, okay. So, answer is three. So what forecast can we make from this interpretation? Because remember, a five wave move, the direction of the five wave move tells us what the larger trend is. A three wave move is always going to be a counter trend move. It's always gonna be a counter trend structure. So from a trading perspective, what do we want to do as traders? Are we buying, who's buying? Who's selling? We got sellers. Awesome. This is the forecast that we can make. We can say, okay, hey, with five waves down and three waves up, we can at least expect a move to below 144.21, and that's in wave C. Uh, whenever, you're working, whenever you're working a zigzag, uh, the most common relationship between wave C and wave A is equality. If it's a third wave, then you're gonna see larger multiples like 1.618, 2.0, 2.618, things like that. Yes? Yes. Yeah. So here we have the top of wave C. I mean, it doesn't look exactly like this, but you have a end of a corrective move at mm -hmm. the C level. Where would you put on your short? Where you, where you have your Fibonacci return? 
I would not be looking to sell it here. Okay, Even though I can count it up and done. Right. The reason why is because all too often I'll see something like this, say it's the top, take a position, and then ultimately I'm proven wrong. Right. Okay? I want to see something on the price chart that argues that yes, that was indeed a top, confirming price action. A trade to me is like a party. I want to arrive fashionably late and I want to leave before the cops come. Let's you know what kind of parties I like to go to. Okay? So I'm always going to be late. In this instance here, the few, uh, the, probably the soonest I would be looking to actually take the position would be over here with a stop against the high. And the reason why, and this is also worth writing down, notice that advance. Now notice the subsequent decline. That's what I call a wave of equal weight in the opposing direction. One of the best way to, ways to identify a top or a bottom in a market is look for a wave of equal weight in the opposing direction. That's, that's something that, again, it's one of my trade setups. When I see something like that, that again bolsters my confidence that, we'd ha that wave C is indeed done and I'll be looking for the market to continue lower. Yes? Exactly. It could have turned into a complex correction where a WXY happens. Would you retake the short after what you believe is a completed complex? That's a, that's a, <clears throat> okay. What I, uh, the question is, excellent question. Would I retake a, a, self, a short position in this if I had been stopped out? If, like, for example, if I had been, say, gotten in here, the market goes up, spikes up, takes out my stop, would I get back in? The answer is yes. Uh, all too often, when we take a position in a market uh, and we get stopped out or we cut it loose because we think we're wrong, uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because you're initially wrong does not mean you're ultimately going to be proven wrong. Okay? Stick with it. Watch what happens because you might actually see the market do what you originally think it's going to do. Okay? For example, this is a, a story we all can relate to. That's one of the things I love about traders. We've all been through it. We've all, we, 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 we experience the same difficulties as traders. The camaraderie is, is unbelievable. For example, um, you're looking at a market. You think it's bottomed. You take a position to the buy side. Okay? How many have done that? Raise your hands. Okay? Market starts going up, you start getting excited, start patting yourself on the back, and you start doing the math. What's doing the math? You start counting the money. Okay, and then what happens? The market comes down, hits your stop, or puts you so far into water you can no longer feel or take the pain. Has that happened to everybody? Okay, and then once you get out, what happens? The market does exactly what you thought it was going to do. Okay. Just because you're initially wrong doesn't mean you're ultimately going to be wrong. Stick with it. So if I got stopped out here, I would probably stick with the trade because you got such a nice five wave move down. Now in this case here, again, another nice trade. Uh, here are some of the trades I took during my little bond campaign back in 18, and it was a great year. Focus on what I call the critical elements, trend, Pattern, momentum, and candlesticks. I love candlestick analysis. The wave principle allows me to take a lot of data, a lot of data, data being each one of these price bars, each one of these open, high, low, close price bars, the range of those price bars. That is a massive amount of data. The wave principle allows me to look at that price, all that data, and quickly identify uh, a context, a trend, you know, what's going on. Candlestick analysis, and I'm a big fan of uh, Neeson's work, uh, it allows me to actually look at a single price bar and interpret it. So I think those two disciplines work very, very well together. Momentum, I think, is a critical important to your, say, your trader's toolbox, and also pattern analysis, whether it's inverted head and shoulders, um, any of the old school flag pennants. Uh, the wave principle, for example, all that is is pattern analysis. So these are what I consider to be the four critical elements. Now, if you're 
and the COT data, for example, if you're a futures trader, hey, fine, add that. If you want to make that a fifth component, a fifth critical element, go for it. If you're into seasonality, add that. If you're into uh, market profile, add that. If you have something that already works, keep it, okay? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes um, you can make as a trader is to find something that works and then you do what's really wrong. And men have a horrible track record with this because we're wired this way. You have, find something that works, you do it for a few months or maybe even a few years, and it's working, and then what do we do? We try and make it better. We try and make it better, faster, smaller, whatever, and what happens? We end up totally screwing up what was ultimately working. If it's working, don't change it. If you have something right now, and you're doing well, and you're having consistent returns week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. Please leave the seminar now because if you're, I don't want to get something new in your mind. I've spent the last 10 years of my career pretty much trying to unforget and unlearn everything I learned during the first 10 years. Okay? Simple works. I love simple. Okay? And bottom line, if you want to improve your trading, improve yourself because it always starts there. Okay, pop quiz again. What's wrong with this picture? Sorry? Exactly. Wave two uh, ends or terminates below the origin point of wave one. That's a rule violation. If you're going to do Elliott, do it right or don't do it at all. Because what will happen, and I get frustrated with this, somebody will start doing Elliott, and I've got one subscriber who's um, driving me batty right now because I know he hasn't re re read the book, and he's like, can wave C be a three-wave move? No, wave C cannot be a three-wave move. It's in the book. It's a rule. Wave C is always going to be an impulse wave. Okay? If you're going to do Elliott, do it right. If you're not willing to do what it takes to do it right, please don't do it at all. Because otherwise, you'll walk away going, oh, yeah, that Elliott Wave stuff doesn't work. No, it does work if you do it properly, okay? If you do it incorrectly, yes, you'll be looking up when you should be looking down. Okay, this is a flat pattern. We know that because we have three waves in wave A, a three-wave move in wave B, and that's followed by a wave C decline in five waves, not three. What's wrong with this? Student. <laughs> Uh, wave B is too short. Wave B has to end at or near the origin point of wave A. If you're not going to do this right, please don't do it at all, okay? You will hurt yourself. Okay, uh, now some fun stuff too. Okay, I'm on. Yeah, I got time. Uh, my favorite trade setup, we were talking about this. Uh, the fourth wave pullback. The reason I like the fourth wave pullback is because there's a uh, complexity to the wave principle specifically pertaining to impulse wave development, and that's called a truncation or a failed wave. A failed wave occurs whenever a move that should make a new price high does not do so, okay? Uh, that occurrence is actually very rare. So I like the fourth wave pullback. Can everybody see and understand what I'm doing on this chart, the wave count? Do you see why I would not say that as a corrective price move up from the low? I want, to say, I, want, I want confirmation on this. Give me hands up. Everybody sees and understands why I'm labeling this as an impulse wave. Waves one, two, three, four, and five. Good. Okay, so that's a fourth wave pullback. That's my buying opportunity. That's the subdivision within wave four. That pattern right there, that blue B, that's referred to as a running flat. Three up in A, three down in B, wave C uh, does not make it above the wave A extreme. Then we have the ending diagonal into the low. Does everybody understand that? Moreover, just to keep it simple, don't do Alice in Wonderland, by the way. What's Alice in Wonderland? Uh, falling down the rabbit hole. You look at a price chart and you essentially fall into the details. Don't do that. Lean back, remember, counter trend price action, corrective price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. And that's exactly what we have here. We have a sloppy, choppy, slow move contained within parallel lines. Notice how quickly that move took off to the upside. And the length, very, very far, very, very fast. 
All of that is the characteristics uh, of, an, of a third wave price move. If I have something on the chart that I know is clearly a third wave move, I know what's going to happen next in the sequence. I'm going to pull back in four, and then I'm going to rally to new highs in wave five. So I like to wait for that pullback, and that's what we caught. Does everybody see that? Okay, now how does an Elliotitian actually make a forecast? Well, these patterns have an outcome. The patterns that we looked at, those five core patterns, they have an outcome. A zigzag will be more than fully retraced. A flat will be more than fully retraced. A triangle will give way to a final fifth wave move or a wave C price move. Uh, five waves up and done, what will happen? Prices will fall back into the you know, span or the price territory of the prior fourth wave move. So ultimately, we will see prices come back down uh, back into that, say, 25 area. And I believe that's exactly what happened. I may have a slide here. Oh, and that's just me. Um, if you're interested in what, learning more or taking the next step, uh, my contact information is up there, uh, elliotwave.com or customercare at elliotwave.com. Either one. Uh, yes, Doc? Back up a couple of slides there. Sure. Why would you be going after a wave four when you could be going after a wave five or vertical? Wave two to wave three? Yeah. Um, for me, it has to do with, with um, just a, a mental probability thing, okay? When you're down here, oh, when you're down here, okay, uh, where's my, there we go. What? Okay. Um, this is a viable trade, okay? You have five waves up and then A, B, C into the low there. So a trend line connected from that high to that line over there. The breakout. I'm more than happy to play the breakout. Okay, but at that point, at that stage of the game, right here. Oh, wait, cool. Um, okay, so draw a trend line from that high to that high right there, come down. Once you start breaking above that trend line, that's a great buying opportunity right there. I'm sorry? Yes, exactly. Ex exactly. Okay, now at this point, I take a, a buy side trade. Um, typically, when I first started counting the wave, waves, everything I was, every time I had five waves up and three waves down, I was always looking for a third wave. That, that's incorrect. And the reason why is because markets are more uh, often than not in a counter trend type phase, more so than a trending market phase. So really, at this point, I don't know if the advance is going to be a wave three or we're going to be a wave C. I know we're going up, but the market has not told me yet. It hasn't shown me the rest of the story. Only until we start getting above the, uh, what I call the upper boundary line of the base channel. Well, think of it this way. Remember when I said counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines? Okay, there's more to that if you think about it. That means, if you think about it, that if price action is not contained within parallel lines, it's going to be an impulsive move. I don't really get confirming price action that this thing is indeed a third wave move until up here, okay? So this is why whenever I take, a, say, a buy side position, I always kind of work with the idea that I'm looking at a C wave because I would much rather be, say, pleasantly surprised and greatly disappointed. I don't want to have a buy side position here thinking it's a, uh, thinking it's a uh, C wave, there we go. Thinking that this is, I don't want to start off thinking that that's wave three because ultimately I could be proven wrong. But if I think it's a C wave, I can catch wave C and then see it turn into wave three. But as far as probabilities uh, or confidence, the, the fourth wave pullback is one of the, I think, highest probability trade setups Elliott does indeed offer. It's awesome. So I look for fourth waves all the time. Questions? I got a few minutes left here. Yes. Yes. 
Well, once we, once we uh, start clearing the, the prior swing highs here, again, wave of equal weight in the opposing direction. So let's say I get in at this point here, or even get in later. I mean, again, try. <clears throat> Oh, where would I initially put the stop? Once I get in here, my stop goes right there. Yeah, I, 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 risk is, um, if you want to survive the game of trading, meaning if you want to be in tra trading three years from now, five years from now, you have to manage risk, okay? You're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong, it happens. So whenever you are wrong, you need to make sure it's not a devastating blow, okay? I have blown up a, probably a dozen trading accounts over the years, okay? Who's blown up a trading account? Come on, we've all been there. If that's emotional baggage and you think that as a negative, cut it loose, okay? That's simply the cost of education, okay? So my MBA in trading probably cost me about $100,000. <laughs> I've learned a lot by losing. And, but I don't make those mistakes anymore. Uh, very, very important. You must manage risk, okay? You need to manage risk so that if you are lost or even have three, four, five, six losses in a row, uh, they're not devastating. It does not wipe out your account. Small losses are, are, are the cost of doing business. If you have a dry cleaner or a restaurant, uh, the, the rent you pay, the mortgage you pay on the you know, brick and mortar establishment, it's just the cost of doing business that you ultimately will pass on to your customers, okay? Small losses are just simply the cost of doing business as a trader. Big losses, that's not acceptable. Big losses tell me you're not doing your job in managing risk, okay? More questions? Sir? Yes, sir. How much longer do you typically wait when, remember you're saying, like, stick around a little bit sometimes. Mm -hmm. What is your second stop loss? There shouldn't be one, but how do you give yourself time to be ultimately right? Uh, okay, yes. If, um, <clears throat> okay, in this case here, and this is a good example. Okay, let's say I take an initial stab at that right there, and I put my stop at the low. When I'm seeing this breakout, I think I probably have it uh, by that point. So maybe I move my stop up to that low right there, okay? That sell-off stops me out, which is kind of natural, by the way, where we see the move, the sub, that decline come down and take out some of those prior swing lows. Uh, whatever screws the most people tends to be what happens, okay? So basically the market's actually running stops with that price move. So let's say I get stopped out. When am I looking to get back in? When that high basically gives way. So I'm back in on this area right here, okay? But you bring up a good point as far as time and wait. How long do you wait, okay? If you take a position in a market, and this would be, say, my price stop here. I get in right there, there's my, there's my, there's my protective stop, okay? If I take a trade, and three or four days later, or three or five days later, if I'm not seeing what I want, I'll get out. That's what I call a time stop. Because if I'm right in my analysis, the market should be doing something. And in, in three to five days, if it's not doing what I thought it should, something's wrong. I may not see what's going on or what's wrong, but I certainly take that as a warning sign. Okay, so, so sometimes you're out and you look for this thing and you're Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you're really talking potentially, you know, going up and coming. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, trust me, I've been in uh, uh, that kind of a situation. In fact, uh, I think it was um, first quarter of 2018, um, VXX. Remember that? <laughs> it went from like uh, $200 a share to like $20 a share or $2 a share, like in a, in a day. Remember? You, you know, I was in there. <laughs> that was me. Uh, that, that, that experience cost me 20000 um, Gaps. <clears throat> um, try and figure if you, what would cause the gap, okay? When it comes to earnings, 
for example, that what, that's what prompts many gaps, uh, I tend to be very, very cautious. So if we're coming into an earnings report or if I'm trying to play an earnings report, I will not trade big size prior to earnings. Uh, like um, there was a, a stock recently, what was it? Oh, I, it was a uh, big gap down. I forgot what the, what the name of the stock was, but it was an earnings play, okay? Um, but I know it was an earnings play, and earnings plays can be very, very tricky, so I trade very, very small. I'm willing to take a shot at it because I may be right and I'll, I'll see a big return, but tr earn, trading earnings are very uh, tricky. Be careful with that. Um, so, but gaps come out of the blue. They do happen, and um, sometimes you have to take your lump. Uh, sometimes you need to be careful, though, that you're not too reactive because many times what will happen I see this in my own trading. I'll take a position maybe Thursday, Friday, and I like the upside. And then Monday comes, and there's selling pressure on Monday, and it makes it, it psychs me out. I think I'm wrong, so I'll go ahead and cut the position loose. And then by two o'clock uh, that day, later that day, uh, I'm back in the money and going strong. I should have held the position. That's where we go back to. Again, psychology, the weakest link in a successful trading equation is the individual. Um, you have to trust yourself, okay? Don't let data, you know, hour by hour price action distract you or, or dissuade your, or erode your confidence in work that you may have done over the weekend or work that you've been doing all week or all month on, say, taking a position in XYZ stock or futures or crypto or 420 or whatever. So, more questions? Yeah. Earlier you had a slide of uh, what's wrong with this being the ABC flat to three. Yes. Three. How far are you comfortable with the B wave going before you would call it a flat? Uh, in the book, uh, AJ by AJ Frost and Robert Prechter, it says the rule is that wave B must retrace 90% of wave A. Uh, by looking at some illiquid markets and futures markets and currency markets, I find that 80% is a better guideline. So as long as wave B of a flat retraces at least 80% of wave A, I'm comfortable calling it uh, wave B of a flat. Probably yeah. the key is to move it sideways rather than this. I'm sorry? Probably the key is to recognize it as a flat, as Stefan was mentioned, is that it must be a sideways move rather than a dip. That means you still get a a a flat will have a sideways type movement or a very shallow slope movement. Zigzags are a bit more, or what we fall into what we call a sharp corrective type family. So as a personality, you may help you. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's another key thing that will help you identify waves better is to look at the proportionality of structure uh, and also look at the personality. Uh, I'm not going to try and call that anything but corrective because the slope, it's shallow. Very shallow slope, very contained within parallel lines, the larger trends to the upside. Do you prefer trading triangles? I don't like to trade triangles. Uh, triangles are a very tricky patterns. Sometimes when you think you have a triangle fourth wave, it actually turns out to be a triangle B wave, meaning it'll, you'll look up, it'll come down sharply, and then it'll go back up. Great example is Starbucks on the daily, weekly chart level. We were doing a beautiful triangle and I thought it was going to break out to the upside. What happened, it came down on earnings, bottomed, and then we continued to rally to new highs. In my experience, I like to trade triangles, but I like to scale into this. So for example, if I see it in wave four. Scaling it into a position of a triangle, that I, that I can understand because, you know, as the market commits to you, you can then commit to the market. Yeah. And um, that's what I refer to as, um, uh, market compression or moving average compression. If you have multiple moving averages, whenever you start seeing them come together, that's gonna that's very very important. And you can actually utilize an option strategy for that, something like a spread or a straddle to take advantage of that from an options perspective. So, I think that's about it for my time. Is that right, guys? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Now I'm gonna go track down some coffee.